Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello, Namaskaram. I am Dr. Vijay Sagar, Professor and Head, Department of Anatomy at the Sri Ramachandra Medical College and Research Institute in Chennai. In this lesson, we will be talking about the brachial plexus. What is a nerve plexus? We will start from the beginning. The spinal cord runs within the vertebral canal. The spinal cord gives out 31 pairs of spinal nerves. Each spinal nerve is made of a ventral root and a dorsal root. The ventral root and the dorsal root unite to form a spinal nerve. Each spinal nerve is a mixed nerve which divides into a ventral and a dorsal primary ramus. Now if you see in this particular picture, the spinal cord gives 8 cervical spinal nerves. It gives 12 thoracic spinal nerves. It gives 5 lumbar spinal nerves, 5 sacral spinal nerves and 1 coccygeal spinal nerve. In all, there are a total of 31 pairs of spinal nerves. Now, these ventral rami of many of these spinal nerves come together to form a network of nerves. The network of nerves gives branches to various body areas and the branches from the plexus can be purely sensory or have both motor and sensory innervation. For instance, cervical nerves 1, 2, 3 and 4 form a network of nerves which is called as the cervical plexus. Cervical spinal nerves 5, 6, 7, 8 and the first thoracic spinal nerve together form a network of nerves which form what is called as the brachial plexus which is the topic of in this particular lesson. Lumbar spinal nerves L1, 2, 3 and 4 along with the 12th thoracic nerve form the lumbar plexus and similarly sacral nerves 1, 2, 3 and 4 form the sacral plexus. So the topic of today's dis discussion is the brachial plexus which is formed by a network of nerves from cervical spinal nerves 5, 6, 7, 8 and T1 that is the first thoracic spinal nerve. Now the brachial plexus can get injured as a result of trauma, fractures or birth injuries. There could be the involvement of the entire plexus in which the entire plexus gets damaged or there could be damage to components of the plexus that is damage to the trunks either the upper trunk or the lower trunk of the plexus or there can be damage to specific portions of the plexus called as damage to the cords of the plexus. In this particular lesson, we will be discussing the injury to the long thoracic nerve, injury to the suprascapular nerve, injuries to the axillary nerve, a common entity which is called as the herb Duchenne paralysis, clump case paralysis, acute brachial plexus neuritis, compression of cords of the brachial plexus which is called as the hyperabduction syndrome and finally a few words about the brachial plexus anesthetic block. So let's start this lesson with the formation of the brachial plexus. The brachial plexus is formed by the ventral rami of spinal nerves C5, 6, 7, 8 and the first thoracic spinal nerve. The brachial plexus lies in the neck and in the axilla and has two parts, a part which is above the clavicle which is called as the supraclavicular part and a part which is below the clavicle which is called as the infraclavicular part. The brachial plexus has four components. The roots are the spinal nerves which form the brachial plexus namely C5, C6, C7, C8 and T1. The roots of the brachial plexus emerge out between the scalene muscles in the posterior triangle. The roots unite in, in a specific sequence to form the trunks 
and the trunks cross the lower part of the posterior triangle of the neck. In this picture, you see the roots which are in the posterior triangle. The roots unite to form the trunks which are located in the lower part of the posterior triangle of the neck. The trunks divide into divisions which lie behind the clavicle and various divisions unite in a specific sequence to form cords which are arranged around the axillary artery. And the cords of the brachial plexus give rise to the main nerves of the upper limb. Now let us see how the roots unite to form the trunks. In this picture, you see the ventral rami of spinal nerve C5, C6, C7, C8, and T1. The ventral rami of C5 and 6 unite to form a trunk which is called as the upper trunk. The ventral ramus of C7 alone forms a trunk which is called as the middle trunk. The ventral rami of C8 and T1 unite to form a trunk which is called as the lower trunk. So in this picture you see there is an upper trunk which is formed by the union of C5 and C6 roots a middle trunk which is formed from the C7 root and a lower trunk which is formed from the C8 and the T1 roots. Now each of these trunks divides into two divisions. Each of these trunks divides into an anterior division and a posterior division, an anterior division here and a posterior division, an anterior division here and a posterior division. The anterior divisions of the upper trunk and the middle trunk you can see this, this is the anterior division of the upper trunk, this is the anterior division of the middle trunk. The two of these unite to form a cord which is called as the lateral cord. The anterior division of the lower trunk forms the medial cord. The posterior divisions of all the three trunks, that is the posterior division of the upper trunk, the posterior division of the middle trunk and the posterior division of the lower trunk unite to form a large trunk or a cord which is called as the posterior cord. So you have the lateral cord formed from the upper and the middle trunks, a medial cord from the lower trunk and the posterior divisions of all the upper, middle and the lower trunk unite to form the posterior cord. Now in this picture you will see a schematic formation of the brachial plexus. The C5 and the C6 are uniting to form the upper trunk. The C7 forms the middle trunk, the C8 and T1 forms the lower trunk. The anterior divisions of the upper and the middle trunks form the lateral cord. The anterior divisions of the lower trunk forms the medial cord and the posterior divisions of all the three trunks unite to form the posterior cord. Now we come to the branches of the components. The roots of the brachial plexus give rise to four nerves whereas the trunks of the brachial plexus give rise to two nerves. There are no nerves which emerge out from the divisions while the cords, the lateral cord gives rise to three important nerves. The medial and the posterior cords both give rise to five nerves each. Now we will have a look at the branches from the roots of the brachial plexus. The first nerve which emerges from the roots of the brachial plexus is the dorsal scapular nerve with the root value of C5. The dorsal scapular nerve innervates the muscles of the back of the shoulder namely the rhomboids and the levator scapulae. The next nerve which originates from the roots is the long thoracic nerve which is also called as the nerve of Bell. This nerve innervates serratus anterior and has a root value of C5 6 and 7. If you look at this particular picture, this nerve which is formed by the contributions of C5, C6 and C7 cervical spinal nerves forms this long thoracic nerve which innervates serratus anterior. In addition, there are unnamed muscular branches which innervate the scalenae and the longus coli muscles of the neck. They also have a root value of C5, C6 and C7. The lower root of the phrenic nerve is contribution from the fifth cervical spinal nerve. The phrenic nerve has a root value of C3, 4 and 5 and the cervical spinal nerve 5 contributes to the phrenic nerve. Now let us see what are the two branches which come out from the upper trunk. We know that the upper trunk is formed by the union of the fifth and the sixth cervical spinal nerves and the 
upper trunk of the brachial plexus gives rise to two important nerves. One is the suprascapular nerve and the second nerve is the nerve to subclavius. Of course, the upper trunk divides into an anterior division and a posterior division and you have to remember that there are no branches which come from the divisions. Now we come to what are the exact branches which come out from each of these cords. We have seen how the lateral cord is formed, we have seen how the medial cord is formed and we have also seen how the posterior cord is formed. Now we will see what are the branches which come from the lateral cord. The lateral cord gives rise to three principal branches namely the lateral pectoral nerve, the lateral root of the median nerve and the musculocutaneous nerve. The lateral pectoral nerve, the lateral root of the median nerve and the musculocutaneous nerve all have a root value of C5, 6 and 7. Next we come to the medial cord. The medial cord gives rise to five nerves. These include the medial pectoral nerve, the medial root of the median nerve, the medial cutaneous nerve of the arm, the medial cutaneous nerve of the forearm and the ulnar nerve. Most nerves from the medial cord have a root value C8, T1 and the ulnar nerve has an additional contribution from the 7th cervical spinal nerve. Coming to the posterior cord, the posterior cord also gives rise to 5 nerves. These include the upper subscapular, the lower subscapular, the thoracodorsal, the axillary nerve and the radial nerves. The upper subscapular and the lower subscapular nerves have a root value of C5 and 6. The thoracodorsal nerve which supplies a big muscle called the latissimus dorsi has a root value of C6, C7 and C8. The axillary nerve which supplies the deltoid and teres minor has a root value of C5 and 6. And the radial nerve, the largest nerve of the brachial plexus has a root value of C5, 6, 7, 8 and from the first thoracic spinal nerve. Now we shall have a brief overview of the distribution of the major nerves. I will not talk into the detailed relations and course of each of these nerves as they are dealt with in separate lessons. However, you have to remember that the axillary nerve which comes from the posterior cord is a fairly big nerve which supplies the deltoid and teres minor. The radial nerve which is the biggest nerve of the brachial plexus supplies all the muscles on the extensor aspect of the arm and the forearm and the wrist. The musculocutaneous nerve supplies the muscles of the front of the arm. The median nerve is also called as the laborer's nerve and it innervates all muscles on the front of the forearm. The ulnar nerve, a branch from the medial cord, is called as the musician's nerve and innervates most intrinsic muscles of the hand. So in summary, we have these five important nerves, the axillary nerve which supplies the deltoid the radial nerve which supplies all the extensors on the back of the hand and the back of the forearm and the wrist. The musculocutaneous nerve which is the nerve of the front of the arm and supplies the anterior compartment of the arm. The median nerve which supplies the muscles on the front of the forearm and the ulnar nerve which is the nerve of the hand. Which brings us to a point which is called as the herbs point which is formed by the meeting of six nerves. We have studied in the earlier part of this lesson that the C5 and the C6 roots unite to form the upper trunk and the upper trunk gives rise to two divisions, an anterior division and a posterior division. The upper trunk we have also studied gives rise to two nerves, the suprascapular nerve and the nerve to subclavius. This point where six nerves are emerging, this point is called as the herbs point and this point can get injured in certain injuries of the brachial plexus and that causes a paralysis which is called as herbs paralysis which we will be discussing in great detail as we come to the last part of this particular lesson. Now it is important to realize the relation of the cords of the brachial plexus to the axillary artery. The cords of the brachial plexus are located in the axilla and they are closely related to the axillary artery. With respect to the first part of the axillary artery, the lateral cord and the posterior cord lie on the lateral aspect of the axillary artery and the medial cord is related to the posterior aspect of the axillary artery. The axillary vein 
lies medial to the axillary artery. The lateral cord and the posterior cord lying lateral to the axillary artery and the medial cord lying posterior to the axillary artery. Coming to the second part of the axillary artery, the cords are arranged in relation to the axillary artery as per their names that is the posterior cord lies posterior to the axillary artery, the medial cord lies medial to the axillary artery and the lateral cord lies lateral to the axillary artery. In addition, the medial pectoral nerve is also related to the anterior aspect of the medial cord. So, in relation to the second part of the axillary artery, we have the medial cord lying medial to the axillary artery, the posterior cord lying posterior to the axillary artery and the lateral cord lying lateral to the axillary artery. Of course, the axillary vein lies on the medial aspect of the axillary artery. Coming to the third part, we have the branches of the brachial plexus in relation to the axillary artery. This include on the medial aspect, medial to the axillary vein is the medial cutaneous nerve of the arm. Between the axillary vein and the axillary artery is the medial cutaneous nerve of the forearm and the ulnar nerve. Posterior to the axillary artery are the radial nerve and the axillary nerve. Anterior to the axillary artery is the medial root of the median nerve and lying lateral to the axillary artery are the lateral root of the median nerve and the muscular cutaneous nerve. These are important relations which you must remember during the course of this lesson. Variations in the formation of brachial plexus are fairly common. Sometimes the brachial plexus is formed by contributions from the fourth cervical spinal nerve till the eighth cervical spinal nerve in which case it is called as a prefixed plexus and occurs in about 10 percent of individuals. Occasionally, the brachial plexus is formed by contributions from C6, C7, C8, T1 and T2. Such a condition is called as a postfixed plexus and also occurs in about 10 percent of population. While a prefix plexus does not create any problems, the postfix plexus, in the postfix plexus, the first rib may compress upon the lower trunk of the brachial plexus and can cause neurovascular symptoms in the upper limb. A number of variations in the formation of the trunk, cords and branches can occur. There can be variations in the relationships to the scalene muscles and the axillary arteries and the medial nerve can have two roots. It can have two medial roots instead of having a medial root and a lateral root. Now, it is important to remember that irrespective of the variations, however way the plexus is formed, all terminal branches are almost always present and supply the same muscles. So, that is about the variations in the brachial plexus. Now, we shall briefly look at the various branches which come out from each of the cords of the brachial plexus. Let us start with the lateral cord. The first nerve is the lateral pectoral nerve with a root value of C5, 6 and 7. The lateral pectoral nerve pierces the clavipectoral fascia and innervates the pectoralis major and the pectoralis minor. The next nerve is the lateral root of the median nerve. The lateral root of the median nerve is joined by the medial root of the median nerve from the medial cord and together they form the median nerve which is lying on the lateral aspect of the axillary artery. The median nerve is called as the laborer's nerve and as I had mentioned before, the median nerve supplies muscles on the anterior aspect of the forearm and some muscles of the thenar eminence. The next nerve, if you see this particular picture, this is the pectoralis major. Underneath the pectoralis major is the pectoralis minor. This is the axillary sheath containing the axillary artery, the axillary vein, the lateral cord, the medial cord and the posterior cord. Here is the tendon of coracobrachialis and the two heads of biceps, a long head and this is the long head and this is the short head. This is the scapula and this is the subscapularis muscle and this is the serratus anterior muscle. So, you see this particular nerve here, this is the lateral pectoral nerve which supplies the pectoralis major as well as the pectoralis minor. The third nerve which comes from the lateral cord is the muscular cutaneous nerve. The muscular cutaneous nerve is the nerve of the upper arm and supplies coracobrachialis, biceps 
and brachialis. The peculiarity of this nerve is that after it supplies the muscles, it runs down the lower aspect of the forearm as the lateral cutaneous nerve of the forearm. And the muscle, as it comes into the upper part of the arm, it pierces the coracobrachialis and then runs laterally between the biceps and brachialis to the lateral side of the arm. It is important to remember that the branch to coracobrachialis is given before the nerve enters the muscle and the branches to the biceps and brachialis are given after the nerve pierces coracobrachialis. So that is about the musculocutaneous nerve which is the nerve of the arm and supplies the muscles on the front of the arm which include the coracobrachialis, the biceps and the brachialis. We now come to the nerves which form the medial cord. The medial pectoral nerve arises from the medial cord and anterior to the artery it joins the lateral pectoral nerve to form a loop and enters the deep surface of pectoralis minor, supplies pectoralis minor and then goes onwards to supply the pectoralis major. Two or three branches may pierce the pectoralis minor and others may pass round its inferior border to end in pectoralis major. So that is about the first nerve which comes out from the medial cord namely the medial pectoral nerve. We come to the next nerve from the medial cord which is the medial root of the median nerve. The medial root of the median nerve crosses anterior to the axillary artery and joins with the lateral root of the median nerve which is coming from the lateral cord to form a thick nerve which is the median nerve. The third nerve which comes from the medial cord is the medial cutaneous nerve of the arm with a root value of C8 to T1. It runs down medial to the axillary artery, to the axillary artery and vein and supplies the skin on the front and the medial aspect of the upper arm. It supplies the area on the skin on the front and the medial aspect of the upper arm. And sometimes this medial cutaneous nerve of the arm is entirely replaced by the lateral cutaneous nerve of the second intercostal nerve and that nerve is called as the intercostal brachial nerve. So that is about the medial cutaneous nerve of the arm. We come to this picture. I want you to have a look at this particular picture. Here you are seeing the lateral cord. This is the posterior cord and this is the medial cord. The medial cord runs down and gives this first branch which is the medial pectoral nerve. Notice the second branch of the medial cord which is forming a loop with the lateral cord, this one. This is the medial pectoral nerve, a loop which is linking with the lateral pectoral nerve in front of the axillary artery. The next branch from the medial cord is this particular nerve which is the medial cutaneous nerve of the arm. This is lying medial to the axillary artery and is joined by the intercostobrachial nerve. Lying in the gap between the axillary, axillary vein on the medial aspect and the axillary artery on the lateral aspect are two nerves, the ulnar nerve and the medial cutaneous nerve of the forearm. Lying on a posterior aspect of the axillary artery is the largest nerve of the brachial plexus, the radial nerve. Coming to the lateral aspect of the axillary artery are two nerves here. This is the median nerve which is formed by the union of the lateral root of the median nerve and the medial root of the median nerve and together this is the median nerve. And finally, most laterally is the musculocutaneous nerve which is coming from the lateral cord of the brachial plexus. The next nerve from the medial cord is the medial cutaneous nerve of the forearm with a root value of C8 to T1. The medial cutaneous nerve of the forearm runs in this way. It runs down between the axillary artery and the vein. It pierces the deep fascia halfway down to the elbow and provides sensory innervation to the skin of the lower arm and the ulnar border of the forearm and part of this nerve can be used in nerve grafts here as it does not give any branches. This particular nerve you see here, this is the medial cutaneous nerve of the forearm which pierces the deep fascia here and runs down the medial aspect of the ulnar border of the forearm and provides sensory innervation in this entire area. The final nerve which comes from the medial cord, probably the most important nerve is the ulnar nerve. The ulnar nerve is the largest branch of the medial cord and runs between the axillary artery and the vein behind the medial cutaneous nerve of the forearm. 
It passes down the medial aspect of the arm and then runs under the medial epicondyle and it enters the forearm by piercing the two heads of flexor carpi ulnaris and runs superficial to the flexor retinaculum and innervates two muscles of the front of the forearm that is the flexor carpi ulnaris and the medial half of flexor digitorum profundus and more importantly the ulnar nerve is called as the nerve of the hand and it, it innervates almost all the intrinsic muscles of the hand. It also supplies the skin of the medial half of the hand and the medial one and half fingers. You can again see in this picture the ulnar nerve is lying in the gap between the axillary vein which is on the medial side and the axillary artery which is on the lateral side. This of course lying on an, a little anterior aspect is the medial cutaneous nerve of the forearm. Which now brings us to the branches of the posterior cord. The first branch from the posterior cord is the upper subscapular nerve with a root value of C5 and 6. You see in this picture, this here is the upper subscapular nerve which is supplying the subscapularis. The subscapularis enters, it enters the subscapularis at a high level and is frequently double. Lower down you see another nerve here, this is the lower subscapular nerve with the same root value of C5 and 6. This nerve also supplies the lower part of subscapularis and additionally it supplies teres major. Note that there is a third nerve, the thoracodorsal nerve which is originating from the posterior cord in the interval between the upper subscapular nerve and the lower subscapular nerve. Look at this relation carefully. The first nerve which comes out from the posterior cord is the upper subscapular nerve, then is the thoracodorsal nerve which is supplying the latissimus dorsi and next is the lower subscapular nerve which is supplying the lower part of subscapularis. This is the picture showing the branches of the posterior cord. This is the upper subscapular nerve supplying the upper part of subscapularis. This is the thoracodorsal nerve supplying the latissimus dorsi. This is the lower subscapular nerve which is supplying the lower part of subscapularis as well as teres major. And this is another nerve, the axillary nerve which passes through the quadrangular space along with the posterior circumflex humeral vessels to supply the deltoid and the teres minor. And this of course is the largest branch of the posterior cord, the radial nerve which runs in the radial groove on the posterior aspect of the humerus. The thoracodorsal nerve as we have seen originates in the interval between the upper subscapular nerve and the lower subscapular nerve and it accompanies the subscapular artery along the posterior axillary wall and supplies a large muscle, the latissimus dorsi. We come to an important nerve nerve, the axillary nerve. The axillary nerve as seen here, it travels along with the posterior circumflex humeral vessels and passes through the quadrangular space and it supplies an articular branch to the shoulder joint and supplies primarily two important muscles, namely the deltoid and teres minor. It provides innervation to the skin over the deltoid muscle. As it passes through the quadrangular space, the axillary nerve divides into two branches, an anterior branch and a posterior branch. The anterior branch runs along with the posterior circumflex humeral vessels and supplies deltoid and skin over the middle of the deltoid. So it is giving motor branches to the deltoid and it is giving sensory branches to the skin over the middle of the deltoid muscle. Additionally, there is a posterior branch which continues as the lateral upper cutaneous nerve of the arm. This posterior branch supplies the posterior and lower parts of the deltoid and it also supplies the teres minor. So you have the anterior branch which is supplying the anterior aspect of the deltoid and is giving cutaneous supply to the skin over the middle of the deltoid and you have a posterior branch which is supplying the lower parts of the deltoid, the posterior parts of the deltoid and it is also giving a branch to the teres minor. So these are the branches of the axillary nerve, an anterior branch and a posterior branch. Which now brings us to the thickest nerve of the posterior cord, in fact the thickest nerve in the entire brachial plexus which is the radial nerve. It is derived from uh, cervical nerves C5, 6, 7, 8 and T1. It courses through the axilla through the triangular space along with the profunda brachii artery. It enters the radial groove to pass between the long and the medial heads of triceps on the posterior aspect of the arm. 
It passes in the lateral part of the cubital fossa and divides into two nerves, a superficial branch and a deep branch. The superficial branch is sensory and the deep branch supplies the extensors. As I had mentioned earlier, the radial nerve supplies all extensors on the posterior aspect, that is the extensors on the back of the arm, extensors on the back of the forearm and the extensors of the wrist, all are supplied by the radial nerve. You can see in this picture that all muscles on the back of the arm, the back of the forearm and the extensors of the wrist, all these muscles are supplied by the radial nerve. So, to summarize, what we have studied so far is, how is the brachial plexus formed? The brachial plexus is formed by the ventral rami of C5, C6, C7, C8 and T1. The roots unite to form trunks. The upper trunk is formed by the roots of C5 and 6. The middle trunk is formed by the root of C7 and the lower trunk is formed by the roots of C8 and T1. Each of these trunks divide into two divisions, an anterior division and a posterior division. The anterior divisions of the upper trunk and the middle trunk form the lateral cord. The anterior division of the lower trunk forms the medial cord and the posterior divisions of all the three trunks form the posterior cord. We have seen the various branches which come out from each of these cords. The lateral cord gives rise to the lateral pectoral nerve, the lateral root of the median nerve and the musculocutaneous nerve. The medial cord gives rise to the medial pectoral nerve, the medial root of the median nerve, the medial cutaneous nerve of the arm, the medial cutaneous nerve of the forearm and the ulnar nerve. The posterior cord gives rise to the upper subscapular nerve, the lower subscapular nerve, the thoracodorsal nerve, the axillary nerve and the radial nerve. We have seen the relations of the cords to the brachial plexus to the axillary artery. We have seen how the relations are different in relation to the first part of the axillary artery, how the relations are different with respect to the second part of the axillary artery and how the various branches of the brachial plexus are related to the third part of the axillary artery. We have seen the variations which occur in the brachial plexus. We have seen what is a prefixed plexus when there is contribution from T4 and we have seen a postfixed plexus when there is a contribution from the second thoracic spinal nerve. Now we shall study the applied aspects of the brachial plexus. We will be studying the following clinical conditions. Lesion of the long thoracic nerve of Bell, lesion of the suprascapular nerve, injury to the axillary nerve, upper trunk palsy, lower trunk palsy, acute brachial plexus neuritis and a clinical procedure called the brachial plexus block. So let us start with the first clinical condition, a lesion of the long thoracic nerve of Bell. The commonest causes of injury to the long thoracic nerve is sudden heavy loads on a shoulder and carrying heavy loads on the shoulder. Paralysis of the long thoracic nerve manifests as winging of the scapula. It may be the only clinical manifestation if you ask a patient to press against a wall you can see that the medial border of the scapula becomes very, very prominent. So this is how the paralysis of the long thoracic nerve is demonstrated by asking the patient to push against a wall. The main function of serratus anterior is to keep the medial border of the scapula in close opposition to the thoracic wall. This is the serratus anterior and the main action of this muscle is to keep the medial border of the scapula in opposition to the thoracic wall. The moment there is loss of nerve supply to this particular muscle, when a patient presses against the wall, the medial border of the scapula will come out and protrude outside and this is what is called as winging of the scapula. The next condition is the lesion of the suprascapular nerve. The suprascapular nerve passes in a notch which is called as the suprascapular notch and it is commonly involved in what is called as an entrapment neuropathy where it gets compressed in the suprascapular notch. Trauma to the scapula and the shoulder is a frequent cause of injury to the suprascapular nerve and this manifests as pain in the shoulder region. The suprascapular nerve supplies supraspinatus and infraspinatus. Supraspinatus has a role in the initiation of abduction and infraspinatus 
is a lateral rotator of the shoulder joint. So an entrapment of the suprascapular nerve will cause difficulty in abduction and will cause difficulty in lateral rotation because of the involvement of these two muscles, namely the supraspinatus and the infraspinatus. Next we come to the lesions of the axillary nerve. The axillary nerve is commonly involved in dislocations of the shoulder joint. It is commonly involved in the fractures of the upper end of the humerus and by misplaced injections into the deltoid muscle. It manifests as wasting and weakness of the deltoid with a loss of contour of the shoulder. The abduction of the shoulder is affected because the deltoid muscle is paralyzed and it is one of the strongest abductors of the shoulder joint. The moment there is a damage to the axillary nerve, the abduction of the shoulder joint gets affected. There is the sensory loss on the outer aspect of the upper arm below the acromion. This we have studied earlier in the lesson that the anterior division of the axillary nerve after supplying the anterior parts of the deltoid supplies skin on the outer aspects of the deltoid muscle. So there is a sensory loss in this area and there is a weak lateral rotation because of the involvement of teres minor. Again we had studied earlier in the lesson that the posterior division of the axillary nerve in addition to supplying the posterior parts of deltoid also supplies teres minor and teres minor is an important lateral rotator. So there is once there is paralysis of teres minor the lateral rotation becomes weak. So that is about the involvement of the axillary nerve which brings us to a very important topic which is called as the upper trunk paralysis. It is also called as the herbs paralysis. The site of the injury is the herbs point which we have seen earlier in the lesson is formed by the union of C5, 6 and roots which form the upper trunk and the upper trunk giving rise to two divisions, the anterior division and the posterior division and two nerves emerging out from the upper trunk namely the suprascapular nerve and the nerve to subclavius. The nerves arising from the upper trunk are involved, the lateral and posterior cords of the brachial plexus involved and the nerve roots which are involved are C5 and C6 spinal nerves. And the mechanism of injury is due to an undue separation of the head from the shoulder as occurs during a difficult birth injury, difficult birth procedure in which the, the fetal head is stretched thus stretching the neck against the shoulder. This is undue separation of the head from the neck. This also happens in a fall from a motorcycle in which the neck is stretched against the shoulder. There is an undue and wide separation of the neck from the shoulder. This results in the tearing of the upper part of the brachial plexus and the injury is usually in the region of the herbs point. So what are the roots which get involved? The roots which usually get involved are the C5, the C6 and sometimes the C7 root and the muscles which are paralyzed include when the upper trunk is damaged there is the involvement of the suprascapular nerve. The suprascapular nerve as we mentioned just before supplies two important muscles the supraspinatus and the infraspinatus. The supraspinatus has a role in the abduction of the shoulder joint so the abduction of the shoulder joint becomes weak. The infraspinatus has a role in the lateral rotation of the humerus. So the lateral rotation becomes weak because of the paralysis of infraspinatus. From the lateral cord, the musculocutaneous nerve gets involved. So there is loss of nerve supply to the biceps and brachialis. Biceps is an important flexor at the elbow joint. It is also an important supinator at the elbow joint. So the moment the biceps is paralyzed, flexion at the elbow joint is affected and supination at the elbow joint is affected. The brachialis also causes flexion at the elbow, jo elbow joint and the moment the brachialis is paralyzed, flexion at the elbow joint is affected. From the posterior cord, there is the involvement of the axillary and the radial nerves. The axillary nerve supplies the deltoid and the teres minor, so abduction and lateral rotation at the shoulder joint is affected. The radial nerve supplies brachioradialis which causes flexion at the elbow joint and supination from pronation. So the moment the radial nerve is involved, the flexion at the elbow joint is affected and the act of supination from pronation that is affected. And finally, the supinator is supplied by the radial nerve and the moment supinator is paralyzed, supination is affected at the radio ulnar joints. So what you have is the position of the hand is in this 
typical position which is called as the policeman's tip hand or a waiter's tip hand. In herbs paralysis, the position of the limb is one in which the arm hangs by the side, it is adducted because there is no abduction due to the loss of deltoid and supraspinatus. It is medially rotated because there is no lot lateral rotation provided by the teres minor and the deltoid. There is extension at the elbow because there is no flexion due to the loss of biceps and brachialis. And the forearm is pronated, there is no supination because of loss of supinator, biceps and brachioradialis. So this is the position of the hand in case of herbs paralysis. Which brings us to a similar condition which is called as the backpacker's palsy. A heavy load on the shoulder produces the same effect of separating the neck from the shoulder. A heavy load here produces the same effect of separating the neck from the shoulder and this usually occurs in those have wearing prolonged wearing of a heavy backpack or sudden loading of a heavy backpack on weak shoulder muscles. This causes micro trauma to the superior trunk of the brachial plexus and results in motor and sensory def deficits in distribution of the musculocutaneous and radial nerves. It includes severe muscle spasms in the upper limb. The next paralysis which occurs is the clump case paralysis or an injury to the lower trunk. The lower trunk that is formed by the union of C8 and T1 spinal nerves. This is the one which gets injured in clump case paralysis and the cord which is involved here is the medial cord and the nerves which commonly get affected are the ulnar nerve and the medial cutaneous nerve of the arm and the medial cutaneous nerve of the forearm. The cause of injury is a birth injury or an undue abduction of the arm while holding on to something with the hands during fall from a height. A cervical rib can also cause compression of the lower trunk of the brachial plexus and cause this particular injury. Let us have a look at, look at some of the pictures in which this lower trunk of the brachial plexus gets affected. This is a common kind of birth injury in which the hand is pulled along for the delivery and this, is a, this causes a stretching of the lower trunk of the brachial plexus. This action of pulling the hand out during delivery causes stretching at the lower trunk, lower part of the brachial plexus. A fall from a height, an individual who is falling from a height clutching onto something suddenly, this will cause again a stretching of the lower trunk of the brachial plexus. The presence of a cervical rib, you can see in this particular picture, this is the first rib and normally the axillary artery and the lower trunk of the brachial plexus lie on the first rib. The presence of a cervical rib here will elevate the lower trunk of the brachial plexus along with the axillary artery and will cause compression of the lower trunk leading th to this paralysis which is called as the clump kiss paralysis in which the main nerves which are affected include the ulnar nerve, the medial cutaneous nerve of the arm and the medial cutaneous nerve of the forearm. We have seen that the ulnar nerve is involved. This causes paralysis of the intrinsic muscles of the hand and the ulnar flexors of the wrist and the fingers. The clump case paralysis or a lower trunk injury manifests as what is called as the ulnar claw hand that is the medial two fingers are more affected and the ulnar claw hand manifests as hyperextension at the metacarpophalangeal joint and flexion at the interphalangeal joints. The ulnar nerve supplies two important sets of muscles in the hand namely the lumbricals and the interosseae that is the medial two lumbricals are supplied by the ulnar nerve and the interosseae are also supplied by the, lumb, by the ulnar nerve. These muscles are inserted into the dorsal digital expansion and the main action of these muscles that is the medial two lumbricals along with the interosseae cause flexion at the metacarpophalangeal joint and extension at the interphalangeal joints. So the main action of the lumbricals and interosseae through their action on the dorsal digital expansion is a flexion at the metacarpophalangeal joints and an extension at the interphalangeal joints. The moment there is a loss of nerve supply to the uh, lumbricals in the interosseae, the opposite muscles take over and what results is the opposite action that is an extension at the metacarpophalangeal joints and a flexion at the interphalangeal joints. This causes what is called as the claw hand. 
Now, one of the tests used to determine the paralysis of the ulnar nerve is what is called as a Froman sign. When we ask a patient to hold a piece of paper between the thumb and the finger, this is the normal action of adduction. The adduction is carried out by a muscle which is called as adductor pollicis. And adductor pollicis is supplied by the ulnar nerve. So, you, if you ask a patient with an intact ulnar nerve to hold a piece of paper between the thumb and the finger, this is what the patient will do. He will clasp the paper between the thumb and the finger and this, is, this action is caused by the adductor pollicis. This is the action of adduction and this is caused by the adductor pollicis which is supplied by the intact ulnar nerve. If the ulnar nerve is damaged, since this particular action is not possible, this action of adduction is not possible, the patient will try to hold the paper like this due to overaction of the flexor pollicis longus. This is what is called as Froman sign positive and if there is an intact ulnar nerve, the patient will hold the paper like this in which indicates that the ulnar nerve is intact. So this is what is called as a Froman sign negative and this is a Froman sign positive which indicates the paralysis of the ulnar nerve. In addition to this ulnar claw hand, there is also a loss of sensory innervation on the ulnar side of the hand and the forearm. So that is clump case paralysis. So if you compare the upper trunk paralysis, the upper trunk paralysis is what is called as herbs palsy. It, cause, it is caused by injury to the upper trunk of the brachial plexus and the roots which are involved are C5-6. The deformity which is present in an upper trunk palsy is what is called as a waiter's stiff hand in which the upper limb is adducted, medially rotated, extended. In opposition to that, in, when you compare the lower trunk injury, the result of a lower trunk injury is what is called as the claw hand. This is primarily due to damage of the lower trunk of the brachial plexus in which the C8 and the T1 nerves get involved. The main nerves which are involved are the ulnar nerve and the medial cutaneous nerve of the arm and the medial cutaneous nerve of the forearm. And the deformity which results from a lower trunk injury is what is called as the claw hand. Now we come to a couple of things which are involved along with the lower trunk injury. An injury to the lower trunk of the brachial plexus also results in the Horner syndrome. The Horner syndrome is a disruption of the sympathetic fibers to the head and neck which travel via the first thoracic spinal nerve. The Horner syndrome has the following manifestations. Ptosis because of loss of innervation to the visceral part of levator palpebrae superioris. Meiosis due to the loss of dilator's pupillae. Anhydrosis because of loss of innervation to the sweat glands which are supplied by the sympathetic fibers. An apparent pseudo enophthalmos, the eye appears shrunken into the socket. Loss of the ciliospinal reflex that is pinching the skin at the nape of the neck does not produce a dilatation of pupil because of the loss of dilator pupillae. In addition, in small children, there is the occurrence of heterochromia which is due to the interference with melanin pigmentation of the iris. Next, we come to a condition which is called as the hyperabduction syndrome, which is result of a prolonged hyperabduction of the shoulder joint, which occurs in manual tasks like painting a ceiling in which there is a prolonged abduction of the upper limb. This causes a compression of the axillary nerves and the vessels and the nerves between the coracoid process and the pectoralis minor tendon. The common neurological symptoms include a pain radiating down the arm, numbness, paresthesias and tingling sensations and muscle weakness. The arterial obstruction causes upper limb ischemia and distension of the superficial veins and this condition is usually relieved by rest and painkillers. So the main thing which happens in the hyperabduction syndrome is the compression of the axillary vessels and nerves between the coracoid process and the pectoralis minor tendon. It's usually relieved by rest. No specific treatment is required other than a few painkillers and the condition settles down by itself. Another condition which is involved, uh, which involves the brachial plexus is the acute brachial plexus neuritis. It is a neurological disorder of unknown cause. 
and there is a sudden onset of severe pain around the shoulder and usually it begins in night and results in severe muscle weakness and it usually involves the muscles supplied by the upper trunk of the brachial plexus. And the neuritis is usually preceded by an upper respiratory tract infection or vaccination or some non-specific trauma. This usually is a self-limiting condition. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs and gabapentin or pre-gabapentin are the drugs which can be used to relieve the symptoms and the condition resolves over a period of time. Finally, we come to a clinical procedure which is the brachial plexus block. This procedure involves installation of an anesthetic agent around various parts of the brachial plexus and it's useful for surgery on the upper limb without general anesthesia. The approaches where the brachial plexus can be blocked with an anesthetic agent include an interscaline approach where the local anesthetic is infiltrated into this area, a supraclavicular area where the trunks of the brachial plexus are uh, anesthetized by installing the anesthetic agent and finally an axillary approach. Of these three approaches, the supraclavicular approach for brachial plexus block is the one which is most commonly used. With this, we now come to the end of this topic on the brachial plexus. Thank you.